Hear me? Hello, good morning everybody. We're here at noon. I hope you had a coffee to put up with this next two hours. I hope I'm going to be uh, interesting for you, even though it's technical. Let's do it uh, nice and cool. And I hope it, it will be fun. My name is Madur Manuel Guerra. I'm a forensic analyst in the Central Analytical Office of the National Police. I'm the editor of Glider.is. So when I have ideas for articles and I have time, I publish uh, these uh, Glider articles. I a, have a, a, a bit of a cold and my voice is not really OK. I'm going to talk about forensic analysis in WhatsApp. Why WhatsApp? Why not Telegram or Facebook, Facebook chat or other messenger applications? Well, WhatsApp today in Spain and in Europe is the messaging application which is the most used in the whole of Europe and in many countries. So it's the messaging uh, application that is the most used. So that's where we have to make more efforts to know and to learn how it works in order to have evidence that can be valid in a trial. If WhatsApp if is the most uh, popular application, it's the application that uh, is used by the most, uh, the highest number of criminals. It's basic, so we have to make more efforts to have um, crime evidence out of the application in a correct way. That's the basic motivation of choosing WhatsApp and not and not other applications. Another applic uh, motivation is more personal. Apart from what I just said, uh, WhatsApp has a handicap. It's one of the applications that is updated, uh, more updated in a per in a periodic way. Other uh, messenger applications are not updated that often. Whereas WhatsApp, in three to f four months, we can have three, four, even five critical updates. What is a critical update? It's uh, this update is going to modify the form uh, in which we use WhatsApp. I'm not talking about a user, but about a forensic. So users are okay, but at forensic level, there are mm, radical changes, and we have to change. Uh, totally in the way in which we interpret a, 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 an image, uh, a text, it's another motivation. We have to be updated, 100% updated. I'm not going to explain how WhatsApp works, and, and then you can forget about it. No, it's not the case, because in three months, this is going to change again. And we have to refine and to be updated with WhatsApp. We cannot start building the house uh, starting by the the ceiling. So what is the first thing we have to do with an electronic uh, digital evidence? If you were with me on Thursday, you can imagine what could happen. But if you weren't not there, what is the first thing we have to do with uh, digital or electronic evidence? Give me ideas. What's the first thing to do? to preserve it, preserve the evidence, to preserve its integrity. What does it mean if uh, today, I don't have the phone, if we, um, we get this phone and it has a specific information inside, the day uh, this information gets to the court, it has to be the same evidence. We cannot manipulate or alter that information. It, it says JJA, this is the database, the day we go to trial, that uh, database should be called JJA, the same. We have to guarantee the integrity of the evidence. It's our job, basically. But what happens? Digital evidence, especially in mobile phones, these are very volatile evidence, more than the uh, DNA or our blood. Oh, we believe that this is uh, very solid. No, it's volatile. Not just about the place where they're stored, or in a RAM memory or a hard drive, because of the shape and form in which they're stored. For instance, 
see if today I take uh, this telephone and I put it in a, a sealed uh, bag, if the, the phone is switched on with a data connection in a remote way, a user or another person can be connected to the Gmail account and say that this has, the phone has been stolen. And then all the evidence in the device is going to be removed. So we cannot get information in, from inside of this uh, device anymore. The uh, scientific policemen, they go to the uh, crime scene and they take an, uh, the DNA or the, the blood uh, evidence. We, we need to have digital evidence. We've seen it in many movies. We have here a crime scene with blood and we are not going to clean it. We're not going to touch it. We don't want to touch the evidence. Electronic evidence cannot be touched. We can't have um, a mobile connected to the internet and start using it. We, we are to see seeing uh, what are the conversations he's had. And I'm not going to use the um, criminal's phone. The, I have to um, do a good custody. And these are ele uh, life elements that are switched on, and we need to operate them in a different way than the, the, the way we use a hard drive. This, If this is on, it's carrying out, carrying out processes of if we can, we can switch it off. If this device, before we get the information out, if we can switch it off, we switch it off. Otherwise, we will lose information. Sometimes we can't switch it off. There's no PIN, there's no password, there's a risk of not being able to uh, switch, in, switch it on again. So we can configure it in the plain mode. Maybe I, 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 I don't know the uh, unblocking PIN, I put it in the plain mode and nobody's going to uh, alter the content in a remote way. Sometimes we can't do that because if, if the, we have uh, the unblocking uh, code, I can't put it in plain mode. I can use this type of bags. It's a metal bag. It's, it's with um, metal threads. So any type of mobile phone or electronic device that we can put inside the bag uh, will be... Um, it's not going to have uh, network coverage. So this phone, we can put it in the plain mode, but it can be connected to the outside world. We're going to avoid anybody t uh, removing the information, but this is uh, this got a problem. If this is connected to 3G, I put it in the bag and it's going to have no network connection. It tries to connect. The, the antenna is going to be put into maximum power so that it can connect. So it's going to... Um, to use a lot of the battery power. So if we are trying to avoid that the telephone switches off and we put it in the bag, and it's going to switch off very, very soon because there's no more battery left, and that's a pro there's a problem. We need a, a, an external battery. The telephone is going to use more battery, but we are using an external battery, so there's no problem. These are details to take into account. What I'm going to explain today, we can't be perfect, but this is basic. To treat digital evidence in a perfect way. If we don't do this, otherwise the rest is useless. So, what is um, forensics? Uh, IT, application of scientific and analytical techniques specialized to technology infrastructures that allow to identify, preserve, analyze, and present data that are valid within a trial. What is forensic uh, IT? Forensic IT is to get information out of an electronic device in, the, in an adequate way, in an appropriate way. We need to manipulate this evidence it's surprising to manipulate evidence. Oh, my God. I'd like to explain this with a more traditional metaphor. A dead person, uh, we need to do an autopsy. So the forensic doctor has to manipulate uh, the cadaver with incisions, with a scalpel, and see what's the state of the dead organs, if they're affected or not. 
to determine the reason and the of the death cutting the tissue of a dead person it means that you're manipulating the body of that person okay but it's the only way to open the body and to know how it's the inside of the human being there's no other way it's true there several years ago there was a theory a digital evidence cannot be altered in any way we cannot touch it we cannot interact it we cannot manipulate it we cannot get the information out but you can never do that in the now we have all types of um, devices and we have to change this idea we have to uh, manipulate or handle it doesn't mean tampering handling or manipulating or touching it means to do scientific processes but it doesn't mean tampering and this should be um, a fundamental essential processes and the, in the less invasive way always with the good tools nobody would imagine that uh, a forensic doctor will use a chainsaw. a chainsaw for the autopsy so you need to choose the best tool and everything has to be written down if I have to get the mobile phone to get the information out I have to write you're going to root a mobile phone, you're man manipulating the evidence. Yes, I'm manipulating the evidence, I'm contaminating it, and I'm rooting it, because it's the only method that exists today to get the information out of this mobile phone. But I have to write it down. Sometimes we have to manipulate uh, the evidence, but never tamper and never contaminate the evidence. So i explain how it works. Let's start. What's up? A forensic analysis to WhatsApp. I'm going to explain what I'm going to do. At the end, we'll have 10 minutes for questions. You can ask any question. Well, you can take notes, and at the end, we can have time for Q&A. Well, I'm going to talk about I know. Maybe you have another viewpoint, so we can uh, debate and discuss about this. Let's start. Uh, how, what's the how how a, a smartphone works? I'm doing, talking about Android because it's the system and I know mm, better and I can explain about it. On your left, the Android uh, battery, the pile. On top, the applications layer, was WhatsApp, Facebook. Tinder and all these applications that we use every day. Well, yes, you're laughing because I mentioned Tinder. Then we have the oper op operating system, Windows 10, Windows 7. That's the layer for the application framework. Then we have the libraries, uh, sorry, the firmware, the assembler, and the hardware. It's the physical uh, device, the hardware. In the various uh, layers, well, you see the operating system uh, layer, Linux, etc. You know that Android is a Linux. Oh wow! I didn't know. If I don't, I've never used Linux. What's your you what's your telephone? An Android? Well, you are using Linux. It's a bit strange. It's a little it's a difficult to understand how and how the structure of mobile phone is made. But it's a, there's an easier way of understanding. We have the applications layer, the magic layer, and my uh, hardware, my uh, device. We can apply this definition, which is e easier to understand, the magic layer. All that you can imagine that can be done is done. It's magic, and everything's going to work perfectly well. And many people think that mobile phones work because of magic. You can do anything you want. You can man manipulate any WhatsApp conversation because it's magic. We'll see what ca we can and we cannot do, really. This is more important. It's good for explaining how um, WhatsApp works. WhatsApp has Java. Android works with virtual machines. A, a Java virtual machine is a single virtual machine in which an, a limited number of applications run in the same virtual machine. Uh, 
There are many applications in a single virtual machine. This is the Java machine, the typical one. But the Dalbic machine, which is used by Android, doesn't work in this way. So this is complicated in our lives. It's difficult for um, the Android applications. For each application, there is a virtual machine that is different from the others. If I have the WhatsApp, WhatsApp has its own Dalvik um, virtual machine. Facebook has its, its own Dalvik virtual machine, totally independent one from the other. This is a complication for us. And then the memory, so the part where they keep and save the information, this is segmented and divided from the rest of the applications. WhatsApp has its own a single part for, of, of memory. Ba Facebook has a single part of the memory, and they do, can't see what's happen in, happening in the other memories. So Facebook cannot get information uh, from WhatsApp, and WhatsApp cannot have the uh, access to the uh, list of contacts if we haven't authorized this application. So for, this typology is quite good for security. We have an additional problem, the property management per user. Each application has its own independent user. Apart from virtual machines, each one has its own application. For example, in, on your right, there's 10,000, 2, 3, 4. That's the user for each of the applications that are installed in our Android. WhatsApp has a user, uh, Facebook has a user, and Tinder uh, has another user that nobody wants to know. And what's interesting here is if we can access the Facebook application, we cannot access to WhatsApp application because they're totally independent. We can see it better here. This is the file. Uh, uh, we have WhatsApp file within the telephone. And we see U0A198. This is the user that operates this specific WhatsApp in this mobile phone. The username is this one, A198. In Facebook, is A180. These are different users, but it's in the same mobile phone. If you know Linux, you know that each user can only access his or her part of memory. The Facebook cannot access WhatsApp, and WhatsApp cannot access uh, wait, Facebook. So the root user is important. Yes, I'm root uh, in my phone. I'm a hacker. Well, that's why the root uh, user is activated. It is activated as a, a user. I'm just activating the, the root user. So root can access the space of the rest of the users without, no pro without problems. That's the only advantage of being root. To root uh, a phone doesn't make it go faster. I can, uh, and nobody can um, hack. If you are root, is that you can access to specific parts that you couldn't access. But you can ha have many problems. Your phone can um, become a rock, and it, it could be useless because somebody has manipulated the phone. Lately, we can't find so many rooted um, phones. People thought that was a good, very good thing to root the phones, but now the normal users don't root any, the uh, mobile phones anymore because they don't want to lose it. So they are Chinese uh, phones that are already rooted by default. But root means to access to any system user. It's the only thing that we can do with that. If the phone is not rooted, then it's the, our task for an forensic analysis is going to get more complicated. Uh, interest um, directories. You're taking photos, but it's OK. This is a public talk. I will uh, disseminate it. This is public. So video is uh, recorded. If you want it, this presentation, I can give it to you. So interest directories. When you will see the presentation another day, you will see where you can find for information. The WhatsApp core is in a file called data data 
com.whatsapp. All the Android uh, applications starts with that data. Uh, installation APK, the, exec, the .exe in Android is kept in, in this file, data app, app, com, WhatsApp to APK. That's good if, to see if WhatsApp uh, has a malware. We can get the installation APK, and we can see if it's a real APK or, or is, it's another one that's been manipulated. All the applications that we install in our phone will be saved in that installation APK, which is a database, in that file. Then the famous the uh, encrypted database backup. If you have an Android, you will see that in your SD card, in your internal card, you can see that. SD card, WhatsApp, databases. There you will find the, uh, the encrypted base databases. And then the transferred multimedia files. They are in the SD card, WhatsApp media. That's where we're going to find uh, the information in, the, in those directories. I'm going to share my presentation, no problem. This is public. Everything is, is fantastic, but how can we access to WhatsApp database? How can we access this database that's inside the phone in an internal system partition with a user that we don't know the um, password? How can we access? I'm going to explain that now. Each telephone, it's a it's a universe in itself. It, I'm not going to give you uh, tricks for each phone because each phone and the same phone with different root will work and run in a different way. It depends on the settings. If it's rooted, it's an ADB, it's infinite. Uh, it depends on the settings on, in the phone. I cannot explain everything. But I can explain the most basic ways that allow you to get the d database out. The goal is to access a database to get to this database, and you have to get there. There's no other way. And we have to test the less invasive method first. The chip off technique is very invasive. You can get out the RAM memory chip out, and then we need another system to get the information out. It's totally invasive. If you find a less invasive with ADB connection, first we try to connect through ADB before destroying the phone. So from less invasive to more invasive techniques, OK? Let's start. First problem, this uh, smartphone is blocked. First problem, how? With the SIM pin, the, the telephone operator pin, and, and it's blocked, and you, you don't know. Uh, the unblocking uh, uh, design. The unblocking sentence, the unblocking pin, facial recognition. That's another way of blocking it. It could be a photo. Uh, the uh, fingerprint recognition to unblock the telephone. That's typical. How can we solve these problems? The SIM pin, SIM card pin, it's quite complex to violate uh, the SIM security. If we uh, start the telephone and we have to introduce the pin, we can get the SIM card out. No problem, you get the SIM out. But maybe we're getting to the memory chip and we are going to um, uh, eliminate what's inside. No, it's no problem. Some, some telephones plain uh, insert a valid SIM card to start. Well, I can use these white cards, so this SIM card with no information inside, and the telephone will start with no problem, even though there's nothing in the SIM card. So that's, a, 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 that's a, not a real problem. Then the unblocking pin or the unblocking uh, design, the pattern. Even though there's no SIM card pin, I can have a telephone pin. You have to do a pattern, but it's a number. It, it's a pin code. Zero, 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 or one, two, three, four. Most smartphones have this pin. You can say, see even the last pin that has been typed. And if it's a pattern, we can test another rev revolutionary method. You test 
all the patterns. Well, a person has done it. <laughs> I don't know who's that. And Eloy found it. This paper was on the floor in Zaragoza. If the person who's written this, and there were two or three more pages, it took a long time to test the different patterns. No, 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 no. I know when it's no and when it's yes, how much time it was, it was left. You see that? We'll never know if, if he succeeded in, um, well, trying to unblock the mobile phone. There are technical methods. But this is according, well, depends on each device. In uh, old iPhones, the five, the six versions, uh, with four, four numbers, that was a pin to unblock it. And if you um, fail three times, the phone was blocked. But the iPhone guys inserted a small failure. You you write your pin twice, okay, th the third time you switch off, you switch on, and the uh, number of resets started from zero. So it was an infinite number of trials. There was a thousand possibilities, 999. So you can, you can switch on, switch off, switch on, switch off, and every time there's a reset on the number of uh, trials that you can use for your pin. So it was quite easy. In half an hour of 45 minutes according to your speed, you can unblock it. You got the pin. It, it was very basic. For Max, you can uh, push the root button many times and you can get in. So Mac people, well, they, they, they want their users to be comfortable. For the root passwords, you just pushed seven times on the button in the last versions of Mac and Android. Well, this has been corrected, but in fact, they wanted the users to be okay with their phones. We have to be updated and know about this because that was seven, working for 72 hours and we can access a mobile phone that we couldn't uh, use in, an, in any other way. I'm not just going to talk about Apple, but Android had these problems too. There was a, an Android version with 112, 112, and if the block telephone doesn't call the 112, this is the emergency call. With 112, pushing the menu, menu button, go back and you got to the unblocked menu of the mobile phone. And once you got into the menu, you could do anything. So that was an error in the phone, in the, in the Android system. Very small faults allow us to get into the mobile phone. So each mobile phone has a different type of access. So you have to look for it. You can push and press any buttons, you can switch it off, switch it on, and miracle, you can access the menu. And that's what we really need. We need to access the menu. Once we are there, we can do anything. There are more complex methods in Android. With the boot butter, you can do a backup of the con content of the memory. It's the system memory content. You do the backup of the internal memory of the phone, and you can't get into the phone. But with this backup, there's a, 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 the uh, unblocking pattern within a file. There's a list of hashes, this one. In the file, you will see this number. But there's this table, and here it, it tells you what's the pattern. If we had this flash, in this file, we know that's one, two, three, four in the gesture. You have to do this gesture. And you just have to switch it on like with this Android backup. In the, it doesn't work in all telephones, of course, the very specific Androids. But it, it, well, this is a trick. And that's good for your job. One word of warning. This is very important. The aim of this workshop is not to teach you how to unblo unblock mobile phones. The idea is to carry out a forensic analysis of WhatsApp. The way you unblock your mobile phone, you do it as you want. And all the information that I'm going to tell you from now onwards is information that I've actually achieved just by tinkering at home. 
It's not information that I've taken from any corporation. It's not reserved information. Anybody can find it. You can, if you spend a lot of time analyzing database or phones. I don't want anybody to think that I am going to tell you something that's reserved to my work. You could discover this uh, information if you spend enough time doing this. Of course, if you're going to extract from a mobile phone the owner and user of the smartphone has authorized it. I'm saying user it because it's not the same as being the owner of a phone and a user of the information. The user is the person that owns its content. The owner is the person that bought it. So, you know, if I buy a phone for my wife, then she's the user. The user owns the information, even though I can be the owner of the phone. It's very important. Or otherwise, some kind of legal authorization. It's only a judge that can authorize you to get an inf information from a telephone, a judge or a user. Otherwise, you could be committing a crime, a crime of secret revealing secrets. Anyway, how do we connect to the mobile phone? Well, you have to extract the information from the phone. What, attack. When I say attack, I mean uh, connect and remove. I'm not talking about violate. How can we get information from our mobile phone? Well, first, you go to the typical ABB. If nobody's, you, if you've not used ADB, in your Android, you go into settings, and there's always one about about phone. So you go to build number, and you click on it seven times or a few times, and there you'll get, it'll say you are now a developer, an Android developer. So you're now a developer, you click on developer, and you look at debug, USB debug, and here you can actually ac access. But the first time you connect, you need to confirm the de uh, unblocking key. Some people say that they've unblocked a key. Well, they didn't say you is that first they had to connect to de block and to accept the connection key. If you don't accept the connection key, you need to accept one day. To accept this, you have to have unblocked your mobile. If not, you can't, and you can't accept the information from the phone. So let's start the first demo. It's easy. I just want you to see what it's like to connect via ADB to your device. Here I've got this device, which is my lab phone. You can do this with virtual uh, machines, but I prefer to do it with a real telephone because actually the information's in a telephone, it's not in a virtual machine. I think we've connected it. If you've never seen ADB, here it is. Can you see? The text at the back, do you want me to make it bigger or can you see it okay? If we write here, it says that this device is connected. If you look at the bottom there, it's right at the bottom. I don't know if you can see it. But here, right at the top, what's in white is the, the telephone reference. This is the Sony. And it says that I'm connected. How did do we connect to the telephone Telephone by ADB? Easy. So what happens? We open a remote console within the screen. The, sc the telephone is a normal screen. But we've carried out a remote connection. Now do, what do we do? We can browse. I'm going to do this quickly because you've probably all seen this. So we can go to CD. That means change directory make a list of thing that is, CD of SIM, which is where I've got photos, see where the photos are in Android, see 
And here we can see that there's a photo there. We, we want to download that photo, so we uh, leave here. So we write ADP pool, router, SD card, D sim, sim andro, RD sim, DSC, zero zero. Zero 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 one point JPEG. We copy to root JPEG. Mm. Well, there it is. It's downloading. There you can see it. And it's downloaded the uh, photo to the machine that I've got here. There it is. It's a photo of my workstation. So I've just downloaded it from the phone via ATB. So instead of downloading a photo, let's download the WhatsApp conversation. Why not? We go to CD data, then CD data again. You put LS, and then it says denied. Why? Why can we not do that? Because we're not Ruth in the phone. So we can't get the information. And luckily. This uh, phone is rooted. So let's see what problems crop up, even if it's rooted. Now we can enter into WhatsApp and go to databases. And there, what everything, what everybody wants. That's the database. I've, I've highlighted it. The most important database in WhatsApp. Let's download it. Let's, if we've got it, let's download it. Why not? ADP pool, again, data, data, com.wasap, databases, msg, store.db. And we're going to copy it to root.db. Uh, it tells us no. We don't have per the permit to copy it. If you look into internet, there are manuals that say, yes, you can do this remotely. So what you see in internet, they do it in lab environments. And they see that's a rooted mobile. So we've got the database there. We can play around with it, but we can't extract it. So maybe we can just copy it. Let's create a DB shell. We go to the database again. Dot WhatsApp. FD databases. And with the CP command of Linux, a typical Linux command, we just copy it. And we copy it here, SD card. So that's a place we can access. We just copy it to SD card. And it'll say no, because there's n there, that isn't in the shell. So we've got the database. I can see it. Look, If you look, I can see it. If I put cat, MSG. There it is. That's the database. I can open it with cat. So if I can open it with cat, I can add it to another file. If I open a cat msg store, I open. And then I add it on another file that's on the SD card to the part that I can see. And there it is. It's now joined. I've stringed it.
ADP pool, SD card. This might seem something minor, but actually what you're doing is you're downloading a WhatsApp database. And we can copy it. I'm going to abbreviate it. Let's hopefully I won't get it wrong. Okay, I've copied it now. And here I've got a database from WhatsApp that I've obtained via ADP. And it just goes to show that there's some things that you can't do, but you can open it quite easily. Look, there it is. That's just to explain the basics to you. Another way you can do it is via a manager. You can get a file manager, a, a file explorer, which allows you to copy and paste. If you've got a root browser, if you haven't got it installed, you can install it. You go to the file with WhatsApp, and I've marked it here. There it is. I copy it. Copy the whole WhatsApp file. And we paste it on the SD card. We, and that's it. End of story. You don't need a console. You don't, you don't need to move a hair. But there is another way, another weird way of things. Why can't we get the MSG store from the database? Because I don't know the user's password. And I can't uh, download it through ADP. But what I can do is change the file password. For if I go into... Once again, I can do su. I can do a ch mode. And then I can add it to the key file. Can you see it, what I've done? Sorry, I've lost the pointer. What's happened here? If you look, all the other files that are in the WhatsApp are ones that only the owners can get in. These are the permits of the different files. But this one here, look at all of this. I can enter into this one easily without being root because I've changed the user permits and I can download them easily. Those of you who are true forensics, you know that it shouldn't be done and if you do it, you have to explain document what you're doing because you're changing what's in the phone and when we finish you, you, what you need to do is to leave things as they were before well we had uh, six the permit was at 600 which is default permit and there you can see there's that it goes back to have the same uh, permits that it had before this is the last resource so what I'm saying, without a great deal of uh, problems, we can get the MG store and also passwords from WhatsApp, which is what we might be interested in. Let's move on to exercise five now. If you search internet to do this, you can do it through DB backup. What it allows to do is is DB backup is to do uh, an application backup. I, it's actually, in my case, never worked. The DB backup never worked. It's just the command is 
ADB backup. It never worked for WhatsApp. It works for other apps. But the way WhatsApp works meant that this actually didn't work. So we say where we want the WhatsApp act file to be extracted to. We need to say which application we want to be extracted, and it'll tell. It'll tell us. It's not working. It doesn't let me extract the database from what's up in this way, and I'm saying that because there are other applications that you can do that. But we can do it in a different way and we can easily manipulate the database. And there's another uh, fashionable thing, which is to download the WhatsApp version, the 4.11.4.3.1. It allowed you to downgrade your WhatsApp, for example. I've got the 4 in my mobile, and it doesn't allow me to extract database. But I can, I can fool the telephone and say that I'm going to upgrade my WhatsApp. But actually, what I do is downgrade it. It's a, an oldish version. And this one allows you to create a database backup. It's only in this version. So what we do is say, oh, update WhatsApp. We, what we do is we then change it and put this old uh, WhatsApp version, which is an old version, but it's signed WhatsApp. So nobody's going to say to us it's not signed. No, it's a real WhatsApp version. So that will allow us to extract. I normally do this in Linux with a series of commands, and that's it. But with this telephone, it doesn't work with uh, Linux. I have to do it with Windows, with PowerShell. I don't have a, a virtual machine with PowerShell here, but it's easy. You can do it with a script, with a GitHub. Oh, GitHub, sorry. And we run it in PowerShell, and automatically it downloads the WhatsApp database. There's an article to explain how to do this. This is the video that explains how to do it. I'm going to put the Benny Hill version up, which is the fast version. Here you can see the telephone's connected. You run the command. All you've got to do is run script via PowerShell. It's doing the backup in case anything goes wrong. It installs the previous version of WhatsApp, the 2.11.4.3.1. Once it's installed it, you can see the phone is saying to you, do you want to make a complete security copy? The app says, asks you that, and you say, yes, yes, I'll have that, and then you carry on. So the telephone is just downloading this copy into the computer, and it'll open it so that we can see it quite easy without even having to hack it. We can just move it. I, I write down. And it's an elegant app, which once again gives you the, the uh, most updated WhatsApp version that you had before. It does that automatically. You finish, then you go to this file, and you can see we've extracted the database. There it is. And uh, there's more than one database. I'll explain the other one later. And you don't need to be Ruth on on the telephone, any telephone that you've got can do. And it, it, it's just a matter of installing an old WhatsApp version. 
If you want to know where to find this old version of WhatsApp, the CDN for WhatsApp gives you all the versions of WhatsApp that it says so far, and you can download them. But in Android 7, new bot, this doesn't work. I don't know why, but it doesn't work. And if the WhatsApp application is installed from the factory, so you you can buy a phone that's already got a, already got a WhatsApp installed. When you, if it's already got WhatsApp installed in, it won't work. So these are little avenues that you need to research. You need to look into to re to obtain what you want. Of course. I actually give this talk so that anybody can do uh, what I'm doing without spending a lot of money. But I'm talking about professional methods to extract. This is an UFED. Actually, what this is is a, a recorder, a mobile phone recorder. And what it'll do is it extract everything from a mobile phone that you ask it to. If you've never seen how what these uh, CD bit reports look like, this is what the machine gives us. When we connect the telephone to this kind of a machine, that's what the machine shows you. It goes to the data file. You, here we've got all the apps, every single one of them. We've got WhatsApp databases, all of them. It's easy. What's the advantage of these kind of tools? You don't need to be complicated. We don't need to know anything. We just need to find the next button on the screen. And that's all. The next, next, next. Just keep, go to next. And then you can get all the databases. They're not encrypted. Sometimes people say, oh, you know, WhatsApp encrypts its database. No, it doesn't do that. It encrypts the database backup only in Android. And it makes a great report. That's number seven, I think. And you can see it in PDF format. That's the report that this device gives you. It's a report that any other tool could give you. It's just so that you know that it exists and it's there. The idea wasn't to talk about commercial software at all. So, now that we've extracted the files, or at least we know how more or less to extract them, Let's look at what's important. The most important file is MG Store, MSG Store DB. There are others we can look at, but what we want to see uh, is where the conversations are. And the conversations in WhatsApp uh, are stored in SQLite. And they keep that information in an understandable format. And this is how an SSQ light works. It's actually sometimes a little bit difficult to understand. You've just got a series of numbers and a little bit of information. It's different to, difficult to understand and explain. So let's open it so you can see what it looks like. And here we've got a database. We don't know if it's a WhatsApp one, if it's a database. It doesn't have uh, an add-on even. For example, in Linux, uh, such as in the file command, tells us what this is. We uh, drag it over. And I'm going to, if I write it, there you go. And it says that it's an SQLite version 3000 without knowing what sort of file it is. It just says it's an SQLite. So now we know 
how this database, uh, how to operate with this database. If we open it, you can actually see more information. And this is the same thing that I explained to you earlier. But it's opened at an SQLite. That's what a database, a WhatsApp database looks like. And when you look at it like that, you think, well, hey, you know, what does that mean? I'll explain to you what you mean. At the top, these 16 offsets give, give us the security version. This is what tells us an SQLite. And here, and the remaining offsets is where we get the information from a database. Here, what I'm trying to do is to explain you something that you can comprehend. But look, this is this uh, computer design. This is the same as we saw before. What I've just done is highlight it so you can understand it. In yellow at the top, that's the heading of the file. In this decimal, you've got all that information. If we convert it to ASCII, it'll just put SQLite format 300. So that's what the first row is for. So forget about that. Offset 17. This is of 16 plus to 17. What it tells you is the size of the page in bytes. Here it says a hex of a thousand. We know it's 496. That's the space that's left. If we want to know how much each page occupies, you go to the conversion, it says 4096. And, and here it says the availability of option one is no one to yes. So that we've got the reading and the writing wall option. Uh, the change numbers of the database. There it is. 122. 122 or 290 if you put in decimal. What it means, it's the number of times that database has been modified. So if somebody says they've said something when they actually didn't say it, you can actually manipulate the database, the WhatsApp database. But don't forget that the information is kept in many other places. And if we start injecting conversations that didn't exist, and if this data didn't meet the other data, then we've got the proof that this database has been tampered with. Because you can tamper with database, but traces are left in this add-on. Uh, there's lots of them here. This is just one of them. This is the number of times that's been updated. Number of pages, if at the top it gives you the say, size of each page, and here we've got the uh, number of pages, there's 53. If we multiply 83 by each page, you've got the size of the database. If you look at the size of the database, it's there. And finally, the BD code, UTF-8, UTF whatever. We know that's UTF-8. And the SQLite version. It's just so that you can understand at a low level how this database uh, operates, but I'm not going to work on it, no. I'm not going to work on these applications. If you want to know more about how database uh, works, there's an article here about SQLite, which explain in just three or four articles how a database works. And this tells you how SQLite works. Okay. Let's start now analyzing the databases and logs that we get in WhatsApp. And we start out with the most important, which is mgastore.db. I'm going to start about the most, talking about the most recent version of WhatsApps. By the way, I've had to change my talk four times 
because there's been four updates to WhatsApp. And I've had to update this talk so that it's updated to today. I'm going to tell you about now what WhatsApp looks like. Okay, it might not look like this tomorrow if they update it. But let's now look at um, class number nine, class number 10. We open the uh, MGS store database. Let's start, cut this database off with msgstore.db. This is a WhatsApp database. This is the series of tables in that database. There's a lot. These are tables, places where information is stored in WhatsApp. Let's start with the first one, chat list. Chat list is a copy of the conversations that the person has had. It's on the place where the conversations are saved. But we can find this in the conversation table. If anybody is manipulating on the other side, there is a trace that it, this is the version is not compatible with the other one. Somebody has tampered the database. It's the only sense of uh, having this uh, specific table, the chat list. It's not really interesting. Frequency, frequency. It's interesting. When you use WhatsApp, you have the favorites or your favorite uh, charts or more interesting people for you. This is saved here. This is kept here. And it says the number of messages, 21. Message count. Number of messages that we have exchanged with that person. You know, the person who's always sending you stupid videos, well, it's the highest ranking ranked in the uh, um, message count. I'll explain this in the other database about the hits. Now we have group participants. Another table. All the groups that we have in WhatsApp, friends, work, etc., are here. It's listed here. On top in the hit, what we keep is the date. It's the epoch time, 1 1 1970. And the number, the phone number of the creator of the group. Three times the phone number of the group uh, creator, because in that group, there's three people. These are the three people in the group. Well, this is the phone, and this phone, and this phone number. In this group, we have these three people with these three phone numbers. This is a very small database. It's easy to interpret. If you open your database, this could be infinite because each participant in each group is going to appear here. If a same participant is in one in more than one group, this is going to be more complex. So, in a real production of a real WhatsApp, this list would be very long. This is the broadcast messages; they're not very much used. WhatsApp, but for example, sends the same message to different people. So it's not spam and it's done with broadcast. It, this person is not going to your contact list and sending it just to you. Uh, he sends it to all the, the, the contacts. This is the epoch date and the person to which this has been sent. This device, well, at this date, on this date, has sent in a message to one just a single message to these people, to these two people. OK? Next is. This is most important table of the most important database, the messages table, the MSG store database. Let's start with the first one, ID. ID is the sequence number of each conversation. Every time I receive a WhatsApp a message, a photo, a video, any type of stupid thing that I receive through WhatsApp has an ID number. It's a sequential order in the numbers. It means that if I want to tamper the database because, oh, I insulted a person, I'm going to uh, erase it so that nobody sees it. So I, I erase the conversation. But the ID, ID is still there. If you see, it, 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 the ID is 789. 10, 11, 12. This uh, so a conversation that's missing. The 11 is missing. 
There should be a conversation there. Somebody has erased a conversation out of this WhatsApp group. We know that something has been eliminated because there's an ID missing. So we know there's something happening there. The data, it's where we keep what we've sent. Hello, how are you? What we do tomorrow? All the text that we send through WhatsApp is kept in the data table. Text and URLs that we could have sent. We send a URL through WhatsApp. Everything is kept in this column called data. Here there's no page. But for instance, photo camera, camera. we could have sent a link to an URL. That would appear in the data column. Key remote hit. Here, we see who is the person with which uh, with whom you are talking to. Jews means group. This is a conversation in a group. What's shown here is group. It's WhatsApp.net. It's a conversation between two, two, two between two people, not a group. Oh, it's easy. Well, that wasn't easy. I had to find it. You can't reach conclusions with just looking at this. Now you see it's, oh, if it's GG's group, of course. This is not documented, so we had to find it. A phone number and the epoch date. So the time. If you don't know what is the epoch date, it's stupid. Well, it doesn't matter. The seconds that have gone through since the 1st of January 1970. 1970. There's a Linux command that, command that tells you the, the time. This conversation was created the 18th of November at 11, uh, three minutes in the morning. This number is transformed into a, num a date that we know. So that's the date when this message has been sent. Next. Yes, I noted this down. You are real hackers. If you want to start um, put these phone numbers uh, on and to activate those numbers, these are manipulated. No single phone number is real. <laughs> these are not real numbers. No, no you, you can't send a, mo a message because that phone number doesn't exist. Well, I suppose this is a phone number, but we don't know who's the owner. So the database is cleaned. This is just done with a query against the database. Everything that corresponds to the real number, my number, has to be converted and turned into another number. All the databases are cleaned. So we don't start using these phone numbers because they don't exist. So the first time it happens. So before before uh, a catastrophe appears, well, key for me, the key remote hit uh, doesn't tell us if this person has sent the message or if it has received it. The sent and the received message, the key from me, this one tells us the truth, zero, zero, one, etc. When this one means that an out, outcoming a message and zero is an incoming message. So here, one, we have the list, it's outcoming message. The message has been sent to this person. It doesn't say anything, but we'll see why. Here, there's another table, K-I-D, key ID. So we can have an idea of what we are sending. I don't even know what these numbers mean, but I'm not interested. Some of them start with call, call. So in key, key ID, when it starts with call, it means that it's a video call or a, vo, a, vo, a WhatsApp voice call or with IP voice. If it starts with call, it means that this number has received a call from the other number, from the other um, destination phone number. So we know the time. 
All this information is there, and little by little, we are going to discover what it conceals. And the forensic tools are very expensive, and they don't know how to interpret because they don't know what these numbers mean. So we can't really decipher that. Do we have these other field status? Status in is the moment in the message, double the blue double check, for instance. If it's zero, it's received in the device, just received. If it's four, waiting for the server. You send a message, you have no reception, it's mode four, so waiting for, for the uh, coverage. Five, it's... Uh, it's received in the device, but the user hasn't opened it. It's the gray double check. The blue double check is number five, I think, or six. I don't remember. Five or six. That's, that message is a control message. So we know if the message is uh, has correctly been received in the in the. Um, uh, phone when the status shows 13. I don't know what 13 means. If you know it, please tell me. These are just checking check check checks that are made in the database. Here we don't know with this figure, this number. I don't know what it means. The time stand is the moment in which the moment the message has been sent again. This is the epoch format. He sent a message, you can manipulate it, but this you can't manipulate, and we see what's happened, really. Then we have media URL. It, it, in fact, we think it, these are uh, uh, sent URLs, but it's not the case. When we send a photo, we send a URL to your uh, destination. We, so this is the database. This is the URL pointing to the file in your WhatsApp server. When we send a picture, we upload to WhatsApp server, and, and WhatsApp sends it to another person. So this is the photo you sent. And this is the encryption, and you can download it. Then we have media what type here. Media what type. It's telling us what has been sent. It's quite important. Zero. Well, zero here means it's just sent text. Hello, how are you? Or a URL, text. If it's one, one is a picture has been sent. One, a photo, a picture. Photos taken with your mobile phone or photos in your gallery. Two is an audio message. Instead of writing, people send uh, audio messages that last for 40 minutes. Three is a video recorded uh, from your camera. And four is the contact card. People are asking for a contact, and you, you go to your agenda, and you send a contact. What's the problem? Well, you send the contact, but you don't just send the number. You send the name that you have allocated for, for that person in your agenda. Please don't send the contact of your boss, and you have a horrible name for your boss. This person has, will see the contact name that you've selected for your boss, so be careful. So the contact card, be careful of that. Five is geopositioning. I send the position to another person. So we don't know where's the place, and I send my position to the, another person. Here, the field five will appear. Eight, again, uh, IP, uh, voice IP call, call, num and it was uh, on, with number two, call two. We can manipulate it or modify the database. We don't modify it here. We we'll have the proof and the evidence that the uh, database eight with IP voice call has been modified. And the last number is 16. It's a couple of weeks since it started. We can't interpret. 16 is a new WhatsApp option that allows you to share uh, the location for 15 minutes, for five 
hours or eight hours. I'm say, sending my location for 15 minutes up to eight hours to the other person. The other person on the map sees how I'm moving around. There's a new functionality. This is not kept as thing five, but as 16. If we see a 16, that means that this person has uh, shared this, his or her location with another person. Let's see the time. Media duration. Everything is in English. In English. Uh, so, media duration column. The seconds uh, during which the person has shared his or her location. So, 16, and then here the number of seconds. I've been sharing this my position with another person during this time. Then, here, 11 seconds. I'm sharing you my location for 11 seconds. Media name. The name of what we are sending. Uh, if we send a photo, there's a name uh, attached to that photo. So it will appear here. Here, well, it's a video here. This is the name of the picture that we sent, the real name. So we sent a video. This is the video name. And here, the name of the location. When we send a location through WhatsApp, we're giving the co GPS coordinates, but through Google Maps, it shows us, uh, well, the name of the street, uh, of the city, etc. It's saved here. Cayancha, Santander. Just an example, the name of the location. The, the GPS coordinates here, the, it's a precise point, the GPS location. We can manipulate one, but not the others. And now we know where the people are. So the GPS coordinates, either if we send a unique position, I'm here, that's all, or if we are sending positions in time. So we have media hash. This is, well, it's fantastic for forensic uh, science. Every time we send a picture or a video, not only you send it, but it's hashed. There's a digital signature attached to that file. I send a photo with little cats. Oh, I was, I received a photo, a very, uh, ang difficult photo, and it contains, it calculates all the hashes with uh, the spaces for 64, with 256, and it's uh, coded in base 4. So you will see more information about the picture or the, the element that is sent. LCP. Here, three columns. The moment in which this, it's an epoch, there's nothing. It's a moment when the message got to the server. The, the date on which this has reached the device and the reading date in the device. Everything is not shown like uh, in WhatsApp. We know when the picture has got to the server, when it's got to the destination device, and when the person has seen it. This is the epoch date. It's not parsed. And another new novelty here, edit version. People in WhatsApp have added a new functionality that allows us to delete a message remotely. I send a message, but I don't want it. And I put, I press delete, it, delete in my phone, but remotely. There's a hack there. During the next seven minutes, if I send you a message and I want to delete it in eight minutes, I cannot do it, just locally. But during my first seven minutes, I can delete it in the, in the server too. If you have seven in edit version, it means that the user has deleted that conversation not only in his phone, but for the rest of people that have received it. If there's another figure, maybe it's deleted it, but the five is just in his phone. It's a new uh, functionalities in the last version of WhatsApp. And now, how to recover uh, files that have been deleted in WhatsApp. We want to get these deleted uh, files out of your, the phone. 
It's passing what's been deleted. That's the basis to it. Esta base de datos, que ya la tengo también saneada para que nadie me la líe. Menos O, salida. Y aquí le metemos. Esto es simplemente también otro script. Ok, this is another hip hop script, SQL parse. And you can download it for free and you can extract uh, deleted uh, content from the database. It's easy. Of course, it doesn't say I'm deleted in blue. Well, you have to look for that. Here, Manu. Manu. You remember the, the number 11, the 11 that was deleted. Yes, this is a message sent to Manu. And I wanted to delete it. I delete. I've done the carving of the database, and this message has been deleted. There are phone numbers and other deleted uh, items. We have to analyze it in careful. But you see in WhatsApp, you can delete and recover uh, deleted uh, files. Let's see WhatsApp web. Quite recent functionalities in WhatsApp. Let's open this database in the web sessions WhatsApp web. If you don't know how WhatsApp web works, in fact, it's quite curious. If you send a message, it's not a computer that is sending. The, the computer is sending to the phone, and the phone is sending to the contact, to the service. The telephone has always need, needs reception. If you, there's no coverage, your WhatsApp web is not going to work. We are QR. Authentication. We have the Windows WhatsApp that is installed. The w WhatsApp Windows is like a browser. It's, the, the information is kept in uh, user app data. That's not really interesting. Uh, the WhatsApp web uh, database. We have the, all the information. So we have the the browser ID, identifier, I don't really know what, how to obtain it. It's a, a hash, base 64. It's an I, unique ID, single ID of the browser that we are using. I don't really know how this is generated, how this specific hash is generated. I suppose it's an X file, but I don't have it. Don't, I didn't identify it here. We have the OS table, the operating system. So it's the operating system that the person is using to send the WhatsApp, Windows 7, Linux, or another one. This is Ubuntu. And to know if a person has connected uh, in, fraudulently to my web, WhatsApp web. So we know this is Chrome, and this is a Firefox browser. And the latitude and the longitude, the GPS, it says to us here. It tells us the, the session GPS, but it's quite deceptive. It's not the computer's GPS location. It's the mobile phone GPS location. For, for us forensics, we know where the user was, but this is just the phone GPS, the computer GPS. It's 15 meters and the place in Madrid. It's, it's the computer GPS location. And the last activities. We know if this message has been sent and when was the last activity. Here, when somebody has closed the session. If you close the WhatsApp web session, so that it, can, it, it stops functioning. But I left something here. You will go, go to MC, msgstore.db, messages, here. Yeah. K and D, key ID, 3B0. Here, these three key ID numbers at the beginning, well, we have three that starts with 3EB0. 
This is a unique pattern that WhatsApp creates every time you send a message through WhatsApp web. How do I know if a message has been sent through the normal WhatsApp or through the WhatsApp web? We need to look for 3B, EB0, this pattern in the database. We know if this message has been sent through WhatsApp web. Imagine the person has disappeared. So she's sending messages insulting the other person. My phone was on, on the table and I never touched it. Well, we know now that the message has been sent through WhatsApp web. But thanks to the other table, we know who or what computer has sent these messages through WhatsApp web. And that's interesting for us. So WhatsApp uh, is uh, saving uh, traces of everything. So if you try to tamper the database, in fact, in fact, you can't. And you'll be identified anyway. New functionality in WhatsApp to share locations for a period of time. It's called location.db. That database is saved, the phone number or so, uh, to which you sent your location. Origin, destination, and expire. It's not the moment in which it expires. It's the moment when you send it. I don't know why. This is the date. Uh, on which you've sent it, not the expiring date of your session. And here, a single un uh, identifier of the message. Let's see the other table. It's the same. This it's the same ID. Then we have another database, Axolot. Well, it, it's fast, but in fact, you can see this slowly at home. If you're interested, you can see it with more. There's a lot of information. I know it's too fast. I w I like to give you the information. I don't want to keep it for me. But then you will have access to this presentation. The Axolot database is the one that manages the point-to-point uh, -point, uh, encryption. It's not plain text. It's a point-to-point. -point. This database is managing that. It tells us the the uh, single ID, the telephone number, uh, the connection of this phone with whom and when. Through the double ratchet, the encryption systems here tell us if anybody has talked with anybody. If anybody, the person has opened a window to speak with someone. Once we have this person, well, there's a, a message given by the WhatsApp certificate. And as soon as this appears, it means that this person has tried to speak with someone. And, this, and we know with whom you've spoken. We don't know what you've said, but at least a person has spoken with a, a, another person. Or at least uh, this person has tried. This is 13. Yes, practice 13. If you really want to know how this point-to-point uh, -point encryption works, not, not how it's kept in your phone, but uh, Raul Sills uh, gave a presentation and explains in depth how this point-to-point uh, -point encryption works in WhatsApp. Raul Siles, that's in communication. This is not the storage part. Another database that I just love it is the emoji, emoji dictionary. All the emojis in WhatsApp are kept. It's a fantastic database. The most important, the one we have to extract, emojidictionary.db. That's it. And here we find all the emojis that we have in our WhatsApp. All of them. The emojis are there. So, TAC is the name of the emoji. Let's look for paella emoji. Now, you, you can't really see the picture. This is in symbols. You can't see the paella.
Now aquí convert. Está pensando. Tengo internet. No tengo internet. Bueno, por me creéis. Okay, you have to believe me. What you see here is a paella emoticon. Just trial it. If you access it, you can see the paella emoticon. Just believe me. There's another interesting thing about this, the emoji dictionary. Let's look for the burger now. Find your burger. Okay, let's just have a look at this, and you'll find, if we convert this, you'll see, what you get is the a, a burger icon. And you might think, well, why does he want to explain this to me? I don't know if you know it, but there's a slight difference between Apple and Android burgers. Apples put the cheese on top of the meat, but Android put the cheese for the burger below the meat, the meat patty. So if you've got an iPhone, this is what you'll find, it, this burger. What do you want, the cheese on top or the cheese below the burger? I mean, that's stupid, but hey. But if you go now to data, vending, cache, I think it's this one. This is the most important Android directory. It's where the emoticons, and here you can see it. This is the emoticon, this one. This is a Mac one. This is emoticon, which is in inside the telephone that I've analyzed. So that, how do we know if it's an Android or a Mac? Well, it depends where the cheese is. You can imagine writing um, a report saying how you know it's an Android phone because the cheese is below the burger rather than above the burger. Bueno, continuamos. Cuando nos queda 17 minutos. Vale. We've only got 17 minutes left, so we've got to get on with it. Dame internet, no me quites internet. Después te invito a un café, dame internet, venga. Give me some internet, please. Just, just give me some internet. And then I'll, I'll treat you to a coffee. Give me some internet, please. Bueno, continuamos. Creo que nos tocaba ahora la 15. Práctica 15. Chat settings, por decirlo así, eh, settings, vale. Es la base de datos que gestiona... This is the database that manages the setup for each chat. For if I've, I can silence a person that keeps on sending me stuff. All of this is uh, managed by this WhatsApp database. The hot ID is also the person's identifier. Here you can see it's a group. Here you can see it's a user, a specific user. And these are a setup for a specific group. This is set up for a specific user. And this is a setup, a general setup for all users. And this is a general setup for all groups. Uh, and you can see that this is this guy's sick so uh, of getting these uh, uh, videos and and so I've silenced it until it gets to this date, and then it'll start annoying me again. We've also got the content of the message. Here you can change the sound that the uh, mobile phone makes. This is the sound. If we go there to this address, it's a tone. We can also manage if the phone allows you to, how much it vibrates. It can either vibrate a lot or level three, it vibrates a lot, level one less. And then the pop-up that emerges, and then the color 
because there are some phones where you can see it comes up in green or in white. That's where you control that. FF white. So if this person sends me a message, the light will shine white. And this is managed by WhatsApp via a database that's in the internal memory. So there's a lot of information there that you can get out from just a simple app. Imagine this multiplied by all the other apps that you have in your mobile phone, together with the information that the operating system has. You know the whole life story of one person. Let's look at another, uh, bdwa.db. This is a contact list. WhatsApp asks access to all your contacts on the phone. That's to see whether the contracts that you've got in your phone have got a WhatsApp uh, installed. So it'll read all the contacts. And if, if they've got uh, WhatsApp installed, you can talk to that person with WhatsApp. How you manage that, it's GBD. These are just some of the contacts that I've got in my address book that have got WhatsApp. The status is another interesting this thing. Status is, is this the personal sentence I have in WhatsApp. That people that insult others via status, they harass people's status. And on the status table, you can see it. When you can see, you see when the status is updated, whether they update it every month or they didn't update it for the last three years. The number is the real telephone number, not the WhatsApp telephone number. So I've saved it in my agenda. If I've saved it here, so you can see plus 34, plus 34, and the movie star information. Okay. Displaining is what I changed before. It's the name that I've saved. For example, I write any old thing here, or an insult, or, or it's just a, I can share this contact with somebody. They'll, it'll appear as that same old pain in the neck, because that's what I've saved it as, the same old pain in the neck. Uh, is there anything else of interest here? Let's move on to number 17. This counts the number of messages that this contact hasn't read. So if he's sent uh, 20 messages and they've not been read, it'll tell you that. So that's quite useful. And you can also see the day that you modified your WhatsApp photo. If you want to know when they updated the photo recently, we can, you can see that. Let's now leave database. And now let's look at WhatsApp directories. I think we're on number 17. Files. Files in the internal memory saves all this information. If we go to avatars here, that it saves all those images of all the users and all the contacts that I have in WhatsApp. And of course mine as well. And all the others all the other contacts that I have in WhatsApp. I've got their photo and their telephone number. Might be a witch. Actually, I don't know what that is. Somebody that kept this on WhatsApp. However, it's got all avatars in it. But in just files, we've got me.jpg. This is interesting because it's downloaded from a server. I don't know if you've ever had that when you've installed WhatsApp from scratch. The photo that you had uh, appears again. That's because it's saved in the server. Not the one that's in avatars, but this one. It takes it down from the server so you can see when it was created, when it was installed, etc. 
And then we've got this other file, which is me. Me saves information such as the phone number that I've linked. Which one is joined? This is the one that I've linked. Of course, it's not this one, but this, in theory, is the phone number that I've used to operate with this WhatsApp. And you can see all the places where you can duplicate and triplicate all these things. Key, the key. This is what allows us to decipher the databases that are outside in .crypt. With this key, if you can manage to extract it, and I've extracted, I can decipher the external database that I have in the phone. And then status, of course, that's the same as uh, before. It shows you this my status, the one that I've um, put on WhatsApp. And these are the files that are in the external memory. Anybody can access these external files. You don't need it to be root or anything else that I mentioned. What sort of files do we have here? In database, we've got the, the nine most recent security copies that I've got. These were updated on 2 a.m. in the morning. It actually makes a complete backup, and that is encrypted with the key that I showed you before, which is stored in the part that you can get. Here, you've got all the dates. If there's one that doesn't appear, either the WhatsApp was turned off or the phone was turned off, because every day it should have uh, made this backup. And in the meantime, in media, you can see PDFs that you've uploaded, uh, photos, etc. This is a photo that I received. And this is a photo that I've sent. If it's here, it's received. If it's here, it's because I've sent. How do I know that it's this photo, not a different one that I sent? Well, you just click on it. And you type in SHA 256 sum, and you can calculate it. This is the hash, OK? The picture's hash. It doesn't let me access it, because I don't have internet connection. I'm going to try to sign off and sign on again. I just need to connect to change to base 64. Yo me ha quedado el pincho cojao y no funciona. A ver. Conectar, conectar. Tiri tiri tiri. Bueno, si no conecta me creéis y ya. Okay, if not, here we've created a number in base 64. And where is this number in base 64? If we go back to the MSG store and we look at this table again, here we go to the messages where everything's stored. Here. And this table, this number, if the hash that uh, hash I took uh, out of it converts it to base 64, there it is. There, there, there it is. I take the hash and I convert it. And it gives me the information in base 64. But it doesn't coincide. Why? because I've put it in text. A hash doesn't have zeros, ones, or n, or n, n. So you can put, and you go back to the database. Yeah, 
Ya voy a estar todo el día buscando. Bueno, después lo busco. Es, eh, aquí hay una tabla, la que comenté antes del hash, que aparece el hash concreto en base 64. En base 64, you can see the file that I sent. And here we can see this is the file that's on the database and not another one. So here we can see that this is the same file. You just have to calculate 256 and then put it into base 64. And to finish our final lesson, which I think is number 19, which is the log, log file. The log file has lots of information. It's got, you can see lots of code lines. What I've shown you here in my presentation, I'll explain to you so you've got an idea of what I'm talking about. If we find this string with grep, what you'll find is the phone numbers that have started a session in this web. Of course, there should only be one. There's five. In this case, it means that the phone has been linked to different devices and or different SIM cards. We've got another one, which is MSG Store Backup, which tells us the date when the most, encry the most recent encrypted backup was made. Every day at 2 a.m. in the morning, it should be there. If this isn't, doesn't appear in our log table, it means that the mobile was switched off. But if we, we find this here, and we don't find an external file, it means that somebody's rubbed it out. It means that the encrypted database has been rubbed out. In Blocklist, we can know which ones we've blocked. You know, the typical pain in the ass that keeps sending us messages. It, he appears on Blocklist. If we look for the Blocklist string, you can see all the phone numbers that we've blocked and the date that we blocked them. Of course, this uh, is repeated. If we look for group info now, you'll see those uh, users that were within a group. It's easier to see it here than somewhere else because here what you've got the name of the group, the telephone of the administrator, and all those people that are in that group. In just a TXT, you can see it and contact status. Here you can see the status once again of this contact. So if three or four months ago they spent time insulting somebody by contact status, you can see you can see the date and what they wrote. What about Wi-Fi? We can see when the phone was connected to a wireless because here you can see the date and the type of uh, wireless connection. So you now know that if the phones are right up in the middle of the mountain, it probably won't be connected at a wireless. But anyway, the same thing. This is it's the same thing for Android, which actually keeps the uh, wireless name and password. The password that was used to link. Mobile, you can get the ISP that we were connected to. For example, I've got Telefonica Mobistar on my phone, and here it'll put Telefonica. So I know what network my mobile phone is using at a given moment in time. And then 53. Why 53? 53 is the UDP port, which the DNSs work. If I search for 53, I can know the domain resolution IP that my telephone has. I, I can see I've been, if I've been attacked, because it's a historical log. Device battery. Here it tells us if the phone was charging or discharging. Here you can see the battery level and how it gradually goes down, 64, 52, 43. That means 
that it's not connected uh, to the charger. And here you can see it's connected one and the battery goes up, plugged one. You can see that it just is in the WhatsApp log. So the what, WhatsApp knows if we're charging, when we plugged it in, when we unplugged it and when we've plugged it back in again. And just to finish now, alternative access methods. This is the final last resource that you should use to get information about a phone. This is emergency when there's no other way of getting information. For example, when WhatsApp downgrade doesn't uh, work, or there's no possibility of routing the device, or you need to analyze the database in depth. That, as I can see, the conversations on the screen, but maybe I need to know every single thing, whether I've, I've got it via WhatsApp, web, or whatever. So. What do you need? You need a SIM access. That's not that difficult. Access to the SD card, the public side of it, because there's no key. And some kind of other a virtual or physical terminal which is rooted. And we go to the lab. So what do we do? We copy the encrypted database from the original mobile phone. We copy it. We stick it in our SD card in our uh, lab mobile. There you can see it. So it's copied in the external uh, memory in our lab machine. Uh, we can check that there's no other uh, versions of WhatsApp installed, and we install WhatsApp from zero, from scratch. We install it. We put uh, the telephone. We just need to access the card's SMS. There's the phone number. And, and then it says, do you want to restore your security copy? Yes. And then WhatsApp asks the SMS number. It'll, get, it'll decipher the database and copy it locally. So we've got it rooted and we can access the internal database. We can copy it and then extract all the information that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to. And this is another method. This is far more reckless than the previous one, but it works. You need to know what you're up to, though, which is to invent a chat, send a chat by email to print it out. You don't normally send it by email. So how do you do that? WhatsApp has the option of sending chats by email without data. So you can send that and you add it to an email, whatever. Once you've done that, you keep it as a draft. Of course, we are tampering with evidence, but that's the only way we can do it. We go to draft and we can open it open it with an HTML viewer. So we open it and that's what it shows us. We can read it and we can copy it. So we select all, copy it and paste it where we do have access. It's not easy, but if you're a forensic, here's a camera that you can record the mobile. Would you rather have a 15-minute um, video of somebody actually downloading videos? That's the best way of using a forensic software. And finally, everything that we've done, all the information, needs to be signed digitally. How do you do that? You create a hash. You can calculate. And then you can package it up and you compress the hash of this. The only thing you need to do is to always have to sign evidence, digitally sign evidence. So you can't tamper with the information that you extract. And with everything that I've explained to you, you can actually get 
information from a WhatsApp. And what, do you know what the best thing about this talk is that possibly tomorrow what I've told you probably will be useless because they'll have changed everything that I've done. But anyway, I hope not. So, remember, it's not uh, a matter of doing it today and forgetting it tomorrow. You have to be on the ball day after day. You have to want to find out how things uh, work and you have to be motivated. And that's how we can get all that information, even more information from WhatsApp and that I've shown you over the last two hours. Thank you for having spent uh, the last two hours with me. And if you've got any uh, questions, please uh, ask me now. Five minutes for questions. I can hear you, but maybe at the back they can't. Okay, encryption. When, when the mobile is completely encrypted, how can you access these data? How do you think you could solve this? There are different ways of encrypting mobile devices. That it can be a password, a fingerprint, but depending upon the type of encryption it is, normally it's via the router. Uh, depending upon the level of vulnerability that it has, it may well be that I can't access some part of the system, but the other. But it is. It's. It's. It's easy. That's why, because you don't want people to see information that's not there. So it's. It's not easy, but there are different alternative methods. And in a, if you're in a trial, you've got somebody's encrypted mobile. The time that you need to decipher it, is it feasible? It depends upon, upon how important the mobile is and, and the possibility of uh, encryption. But it really depends on each system. We don't do it for all mobiles, or nor for all evidence. Have you got any other more questions? Hello. Do you know any anti-forensic techniques? Can I, as a user, avoid you doing all of this? <laughs> yes, of course I do. And can you share that with us? You can only ask a question. I'm not necessarily going to reply to the question. <laughs> this is like the genie in the lamp. There are many anti-forensic tests. But I'm not going to talk about that. That's not the object of this talk. I'm not prepared to uh, reply to complicated questions. My name is Eduard. I wanted to ask, in, when we looked at the message tablet, there was a message ID, and you strung them to each other. You joined them to each other. So you said that in a real case, the database can be very big. So how do you check the correlation? How can you check that all the messages are uh, correlated? Well, to the left, you'll see the row line. And if you see it's row 40 and the ID is on 30, you know that you've got 10 left. You can either do it manually or you can encrypt it in Python. It's like on a table. It's like trying to find something on Excel. And how? What about the function of, uh, of removing a message? How is that recorded on your screen? It'll say this message has been removed, but at a forensic level, it writes over it. 
So it writes over the line, the code line, yeah. So is it lost there? No. For example, I, I eliminate this and I, and I put, hello, 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 hello. But the ID is still where it should be. So does it keep the ID? Yes, it does keep the ID. Is that what you're asking? And finally, if they've got a real case of the forensic publishing his report, goes to court, how? How, how's it all backed up with all, I mean, how does the judge interpret the data that you offer? Is there any kind of uh, official documents? No, no, it's based on the evidence, that the, the proof. So if you can debate with me that it's not, you, you're gonna have to t tell me that it's not, that's not true. It's a bit visceral, but you have to do lots of um, drawings and colors and things. Thank you. Any further questions? My goodness, there's six questions out there. OK, off you go. Is there any way of knowing how the u whether the user conversations are complete, if they've got a uh, copy of the SIM, or if they've taken the SIM out and put it in another device and had other conversations. As soon as you take the SIM out the device, the WhatsApp will still work in the same way. I take the SIM out of my device, I've taken the WhatsApp with it. Until that SIM isn't uh, linked to another telephone and linked to that other telephone, I can carry on operating as well. So until it's linked to another telephone, the database will still be here. When it's linked to another phone, this is not going to be recorded. But in the new one, in the WhatsApp log, we'll say authentication error, tell, uh, that day, that hour. If you see that authentication error, it means that the SIM card is, has failed or it's not inside or, or anybody has registered in a remote another location. But somebody would do it intentionally not to leave any trace especially to delete some conversations. Yes, they, he would, or she need, would need to change phone and you, that we never find the phone that the person has used. Yes, because the database is kept in another place because of a, it's a different phone. Can we uh, ask the WhatsApp company to ask for that because we have a, a legal order? No. Uh, did WhatsApp give you any information? No. If everything is encrypted, they cannot give you any information. They don't know the content of the messages. I don't know. The last question. Raise your hands. Nobody. Oh, my. I'll be around, so can you, you can come to me and ask me all the questions you want. Hello, my, my name is Hugo, and congratulations. I just love that. I have a doubt. You said to extract the database from the mobile, it's quite complex. You use bu buffets, yeah. The pan I showed you. How does it work? How does it work with these odd restrictions? You said you, you say the second hand machines are not very, very expensive. Tell me where. Tell me where you buy that. They're not uh, cheap. It's it's a memory dump that you do? Depends. When you use this tool, it's not a big button. You have different types of extractions according to the mobile phone. It's a different dumping. Or you can get in, in in a different way. It depends on the phone. It's not it's not automatic. You select the model. Yes, this is a phone, Sony Xperia, whatever. And it says to you what you can do. It's a cloner. You, I don't know if you used a hard drive cloner. It's not difficult. and. Enter, exit, everything is okay. The Ufidi is just the same. You have a very complex software behind it, but for you, the user, it's very, very handy. That's why it's very popular. It's very comfortable. Next, next, next. And then you have the information that is copied to another location where you can analyze it, okay? It's low level functioning. It, well, it's uh, the, the designers might 
I don't know if it's BB or Android Backup, the same that I used, but it's automa automated. And it knows how it, it needs to attack the, mo the specific model of the phone. It's a database of phones and what you can do to that phone model. Thank you very much, everybody.